Well, good afternoon from London and a very warm well welcome to our annual Harry Wine Rebay Memorial Lecture, which will focus today on inclusivity and the law. And it's quite fitting, of course, because today is a uh, Human Rights Day. Harry Wine Rebay was a philanthropist and the founder of the Dorset Foundation. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Dorset Foundation because they have been supporting uh, the Institute for over 15 years. Uh, in our work uh, advancing and promoting international law. And of course, the unprecedented consequences of COVID-19 have resulted in very specific challenges to the international legal framework and the rule of law uh, more in general. Um, and international cooperation and strong legal frameworks are needed now perhaps actually more than ever before. So this is why we're immensely grateful to the Dorset Foundation to allow us to continue to develop innovative projects, but also training and events in order to strengthen international cooperation and the international legal framework. Um, but now let's turn uh, to our discussion of the day. Unfortunately, uh, as a result of the pandemic, Joshua Rosenberg had some of his traveling commitments rescheduled to today. So that means he unfortunately uh, could no longer chair the event and he's sending us uh, his apologies. To replace Joshua, I'm very pleased to welcome my colleague, Michael Olatokun. Michael is not only our head of public and youth engagement, but he has also now become the inaugural chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the Institute of Paralegals. So given his various initiatives to increase diversity in the legal profession, I have no doubt that he will be an excellent chair for today's discussion. So over to, the, to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Kristen, and I'll hope to potentially do justice to the role, the role that Joshua would have served at this very important occasion. Both the Dorset Foundation and Lord Bingham, who has been a key patron and participant in Bickle and the Bingham Centre's activities, have given a real importance to the idea of equality, to the notion that all should be equal before the law and all should receive equal protection of it. But the notion of what equality means and what it requires has always been evolutionary and has changed throughout time. And I just wanted to reflect briefly on what that has looked like in the British context. For over 200 years, there was domestic slavery, which only was extinguished past the Somerset case and with the Abolition of Slavery Act. In this book, the rule of law, Lord Bingham would go on to say that at various points, restrictions have been placed on people as a result of their religion, their sex, their ethnicity. And we only have to look to very recent times to see that discrimination has been permissible in law. In this country, we only decriminalized some homosexual acts in 1967. And research has suggested that even after 1967, over 15,000 convictions for homosexual men resulted from things that were still offences at those times. One of the supposed silver bullets or panaceas to equality issues has been the Equality Act in recent years, which I think has made a real difference in protecting people from discrimination on the basis of the nine protected characteristics in that act. However, there are some limitations to the protections that people can receive from that act. I am a black man, but I also suffer from general anxiety disorder. And if I, for example, were to be harassed or discriminated against on the basis of being a black man, I wouldn't be able to say that section 14 of the Equality Act should be my cause of action because that has not been brought into effect. We do not allow in this country multiple causes of discrimination in the form of intersectionality to be something that one would present to an employment tribunal. And I want to briefly touch on a recent case that considered that, the case of O'Reilly and BBC, in which a very famous presenter brought a claim for discrimination on the basis that she had been removed from the programme because she was an older woman. The tribunal ended up ruling that the evidence presented suggested that a man of the same age would not have faced that discrimination and the case was essentially decided on the basis of one and not two of those discriminatory factors. 
And the implication of that is that even though the claimant was successful and she did receive damages, she did not get the affirmation of the court based on the multiple identities that she presented with, that because she was an older woman, that was the basis upon which she had been discriminated against. So I think that though the compensatory aim of the law had been served, its role in vindicating the perspective of the claimant and its role in affirming the damage that she had experienced had not been made out in the actual judgment of the court. So to conclude, I think there is much further to go in the law being flexible enough to understand the multiple spheres of identity and the multiple causes of discrimination that people can face. We are not one thing, we are many things. And that is why this discussion that we're having today is so important. And I can think of no better person to talk about how different aspects of disadvantage can affect individuals than Bickle's honorary senior fellow, Professor Geraldine Van Buren QC. Professor Van, Van Buren is a barrister and mediate and member of Doughty Street Chambers, who was appointed as honorary Queen's Counsel in recognition of her work in national and international law. I believe at the time she was one of only 10 honorary QCs that were women. Professor Van Buren held the first chair of international human rights law at Queen Mary University London and has served as a commissioner on the Equality and Human Rights Commission with lead responsibility for human rights and on the Attorney General's International Pro Bono Committee. Professor Van Buren was one of the drafters of the UNCRC and also helped draft the UN rules for the protection of juveniles deprived of their liberty. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Professor Van Buren to give her thoughts on today's topic. And I would encourage our participants to leave comments, questions, queries, in the Q&A and the chat, and I'll be threading these through over the course of the next hour and a half. Thank you very much. Well, happy Human Rights Day. Um, and before I begin, I would like to thank Christine, Michael, Liam, and everyone at Bickle for making me feel so welcome. It's a great privilege to join you. Class discrimination is legal in the United Kingdom. Class, class discrimination is also lawful in many countries of the world. So that when a student told me that she'd been shortlisted for an interview and at the interview was told there was too much of a social gap between her and her fellow solicitors, the solicitors were acting lawfully. They could not have said that in relation to her sex or her race. In the United States, an academic colleague wrote that he found it harder to come out as working class than he did to come out as gay. So what is it about that student's background, my background and other working class backgrounds, heritages which are fundamental to our identities and sense of self, but that generally makes us invisible to law? I want to make it clear at the beginning that by class, I mean, as Michael was talking about, richly intersectional, a concept of class not the one portrayed by the media. It embraces race, religion, gender, rurality, as well as all the protected characteristics under treaties and the Equality Act. My contention is that although there is space in national, regional and international law to read in class and so protect against class discrimination, this has not occurred and is unlikely to happen for a long time. Therefore, I'm arguing that now is the time for us to include an express prohibition against class discrimination in national, regional and international law and that reliance upon existing standards has proven grossly inadequate, even contributing, as I shall show, to the unnecessary early deaths of some people. I'm not arguing that only working class discrimination should be prohibited, but that all forms of class discrimination are unacceptable for democratic societies based on dignity. So in order to make a case for the prohibition of class discrimination, we need to consider is class still important? It's generally unrecognized that class impacts even on the powers and hierarchies of human rights institutions. For example, the nature of the legal order of the Council of Europe, which has established a European court to judge and pass judgment on political and civil rights, such as freedom of expression, 
and privacy rights. It has, however, only established a committee under the original European Social Charter to pass recommendations for socioeconomic rights, such as right to adequate housing and an adequate standard of living. Socioeconomic rights clearly benefit everyone, but they have a particular importance for people living with too few resources because it entitles them to basic state's resources in a fairer way. States must ratify the entire basic European Convention on Human Rights, but states have the freedom to be legally bound by only a part of the original European Social Charter. This attitude towards rights affecting the poorest in our community also feeds down to the national level. There is a significant and unacceptable difference in life expectancy in the UK between different classes, even in boroughs of the same city, as was reported in a World Health Organization study of Glasgow, and was reported about Camden in London by its local MP. This is a clear case of inequality affecting the right to life, but the class aspects of the right to life are currently very difficult to initiate litigation and hold governments accountable in the courts under the existing Human Rights and Equality Acts. I've argued elsewhere that in the avoidable tragedy of Glenville Tower, class was a dominant theme. Race, asylum status, disability and age also played significant roles. In the Royal Borough of Kensington, Bourdieu's ideas of cultural, economic and social capital played out clearly. Residents were perceived, rightly or wrongly, of having little economic, cultural and social capital and their justifiable concerns were ignored in such a way that I think it breaches both the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights. So class is important. It affects the most fundamental of human rights, the right to life. This is why class is expressly mentioned in the Indian constitution. Its preamble sets the spirit and enshrines equality of status and opportunity. And class has numerous mentions in different contexts in the Constitution. Class is also mentioned in language which to our modern British ears at least is undesirable as it refers to backward classes and socially and educationally backward classes, albeit to improve life conditions and representations of underrepresented groups as set out in the Constitution. However, the Indian Supreme Court in cases such as Indra Sawney recognised that caste is often a form of social class, linking it to occupation and poverty. It also considered that those who've already benefited from such protections should not do so over and over again. India's example shows how class is capable of being described beyond the traditional Western working and middle class, and is capable of being identified by different countries according to the relevance of different classes. There's been much focus, for example, on the intergenerational precariat class in Latin America. Some democratic governments also think class continues to be important. Canada, for example, has a minister in its government for middle class prosperity. I don't know who looks after the prosperity of the other classes, but it still demonstrates that in some form, class matters. In South Africa, an NGO which brought a major case concerning a lack of policing in the township of Kailisha, stated in its evidence that its membership is working class and poor. And in the UK, the Runnymede Trust, in its recent evidence to the Education Committee, argued, we should recognize that the working class has been left behind and actively held back. And these issues affect all working class people, including black minority ethnic working class groups. So there's a broad recognition that class is important. It echoes through literature. Douglas Stewart has just won the Booker Prize for Shaggy Baines. And recently a book entitled Scoff, A History of Food and Class in Britain, was published looking at different food tastes of different classes. Class also resounds through numerous UK social immobility studies to the evidence that those from poorer backgrounds performing the same employment roles with equivalent qualifications are receiving lower salaries. But class appears to be largely in invisible to law and to legal remedy. It is as if the law has donned blinkers. 
So is the prevention of class discrimination appropriate for a legal remedy or all class discrimination to be left exclusively to politicians? Interestingly, the Victorians thought that class discrimination was appropriate for law. The Housing of the Working Classes Act of 1890 was designed to improve housing conditions, but this is a rare example of an inclusionary approach to class. Historically, legislation in Europe, including in the Roman period, Asia and colonial America, has focused on class. In England, for example, the sumptuary laws, such as the statute concerning diet and apparel 1363, prescribed which classes could wear specific styles of clothing and eat specific foods. And it wasn't until 1928 and the representation of the People Act less than a century ago that class became formally invisible in the electorate. So law is capable of dealing with class issues, but there's a significant difference. Traditional laws were intended to reinforce rather than remove class barriers, excluding those from poorer backgrounds. I'm arguing that the situation should be reversed. There's also been a morality linkage to different classes with those from poorer backgrounds scoring lower on the morality scale. So that in both Roundtree's and Boothby's poverty maps of York and London, which are often hailed with some justification as progressive, what has been overlooked is that residents of streets were color coded according to the moral standing of their inhabitants. It's as if being, being born poor or being born wealthy were manifestations of an individual's character. But I think this has changed with the impact of COVID-19. Industrialized societies have become dependent upon frontline workers, many of whom are working class. This has resulted in a long overdue re-evaluation of working class people. And I think this creates an opportunity to re-examine our laws on human rights and discrimination and ask whether it offends against our sense of fairness that class discrimination remains lawful. What does that say about our values attributed to law and its role in society? Surprisingly, for over half a century, there has been space for courts to read into existing human rights treaties a prohibition on class discrimination. The European Convention on Human Rights in Article 14 provides a right not to be discriminated against in being able to exercise the Convention's rights on any ground, such as social origin, property, birth or other status. And this non-exhaustive list is repeated with differences in the major global and regional human rights treaties. It's also through incorporation in our own Human Rights Act and in many European states which have incorporated the Convention. So it's possible to read in to social origin, birth and other status, class discrimination. In fact, I would argue it's non-exhaustive nature together with the context of property, social origin and birth positively invites such an interpretation. But this has generally not happened. There are some flickering lights moving towards class discrimination. There are general comments from human rights bodies. There are also occasional decisions from UN bodies, including the UN Human Rights Committee, such as in Mellet and Ireland, which found breaches of women's socioeconomic status because they had to travel abroad for abortions due to its criminalization. Mellet also highlights that under socioeconomic status, it's illegal to value women's worth less than men. And this points the progressive way forward to interpreting class discrimination in a way that creates space for it to accord with human rights. This includes, for example, the International Labour Organization's Women at Work initiative, seeking to combat the unequal distribution and undervalue of a range of work, including care work. There have also been some powerful dissenting judgments, including in Garib and the Netherlands, where there was a recognition that Garib belonged to the sociologically underprivileged and that the applicant's poverty constituted a threat to the order of public. But although Ruth Bader Ginsburg eloquently observed dissenting judgments as speaking to a future generation, I think the issue of class discrimination, because of its impacts on life and life chances, is too urgent to wait for a future generation. A more promising approach is that of Cyprus, for example, which does expressly prohibit class discrimination. And at a global level, the recognition of a specific class 
in the 2018 UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants. This provides in its preamble that peasants and other people working in rural areas suffer disproportionately from poverty, hunger and malnutrition. And Article 2.3 importantly recognises the existing power imbalances between peasants and those who make the decisions that affect their lives. These legal provisions show awareness not only of poverty, but also of class in terms of the way in which class relations work in entrenching poverty and in turn the violation of human rights. However, a recognition of the power imbalance when class discrimination is not prohibited has not generally been developed by the courts. Now, some may argue it's not desirable to prohibit class discrimination because of notions are entangled with notions of revolution and dictatorship, as in the first article of the Chinese constitution, which declares China under the people's democratic dictatorship led by the working class. So we may leap to the conclusion that all attempts to prohibit class discrimination has been prompted by communist and former communist states. But this is not the case. During the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, much of the efforts to include an express prohibition of class discrimination, which failed, unfortunately, came from Latin America. The United Kingdom stated it did not object to its inclusion, and the UK is not known as a revolutionary communist state. Now, there are clearly definitional challenges in including a prohibition on class discrimination, but human rights is replete with definitional challenges. When we were drafting the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, it literally took a decade to reach global consensus on the definition, although I hasten to add we were discussing other things. Definition is often a reason raised by those who wish to retain the status quo. Lawmakers rarely arrive at a short, non-exhaustive definition of who should be protected against discrimination. Much has been written about the challenges of defining disability for the Global Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But in none of these cases did definitional challenges prevent the adoption and ratification of the treaties. Sometimes even definitions in law are left deliberately broad. Both treaty law, the Human Rights and Equality Acts prohibit discrimination on the basis of belief. And trust is placed in the implementing bodies and in the courts to set the definitions boundaries, and this has ranged from secularism to veganism. Now, if national and regional courts are able to arrive at judgments on belief, then preventing discrimination on the basis of class will not prevent a greater challenge. It's also argued that unlike other prohibited grounds of discrimination, there's too much fluidity in defining class. People sometimes feel that they've moved from one class to another, yet this ought not to be an obstacle. The right to change one's religion is recognized in national and international law, but this has not been regarded as an insurmountable obstacle to prohibiting religious discrimination. Similarly, there's also a fluidity in definitions of gender. The fluidity argument is in some senses self-denying. As Bell Hook has argued, there's no necessity to abandon all working class cultural values in order to move into spheres traditionally the domain of other classes. As with religion and belief, definitions can be explored on a case-by-case -case basis. This allows space to discuss class, which as well as economic, is also social and cultural. There have, however, been other approaches on focusing on improving the lives of poorer classes. These include the poverty class, referred to in some Canadian literature, lower socioeconomic status, cited in Australia, socioeconomic status proposed for the UK, and the French concept of social exclusion. The first approach must be to adopt a language that respects everyone's dignity and heritage. I'm proud to say I come from a working class background, but the terms poverty class and low or lower socioeconomic status are intrinsically disempowering and lacking in dignity, as is the term underclass. The democracy of knowledge implies there are many stories of great value which have yet to be unearthed, but which demonstrate that to come from a working class heritage can be a matter of pride, an illustration of resilience, and a strength in the power of community. The long overdue acknowledgement of racial equality, and more recently Black Lives Matter, has shown how much we can learn from histories and stories 
which have been devalued and therefore ignored by many. So if we make class discrimination illegal, other equally valuable and overlapping stories can be told. John Lennon may have sung that a working class hero is something to be, but one of the reasons we focus on Magna Carta and ignore its sister, Carta de Forrester in 1217, is that Carta de Forrester in the main created socioeconomic rights for the poorer sections of the English community. Instead of class, there's been a focus by governments in Europe on social exclusion. Although social exclusion is valuable in tackling poverty, by itself it's not made a perceivable dent in addressing inequality and social mobility in the UK, as the figures continue to show. There needs to be policies preventing both structural social exclusion and class discrimination. There's also the concept of a socioeconomic duty, which will mean that when an authority makes a strategic decision, it will have due regard to reducing the inequalities of outcome, which result from socioeconomic disadvantage. Just Fair be running an excellent campaign for its incorporation. However, this is far less than class discrimination, and the UK needs both. Courts of the United States and South Africa have considered whether poverty is a ground for discrimination, and they've taken opposing views. The US Supreme Court in the San Antonio case rejected arguments that policies against poor people can attract heightened judicial scrutiny. This was because the Supreme Court did not regard poverty as discreet and insular like race. In South Africa, however, in the Social Justice Coalition and the Minister of Police case, the Equality Court found that although poverty was not listed as a ground of discrimination, it did amount to unfair discrimination for a variety of reasons, including that poverty was analogous to social origin, that poverty impacted on socioeconomic rights, and that poverty undermines dignity. Although the South African approach is preferable, there's the problem of legal uncertainty, as we've seen with different courts in different countries reaching different conclusions. Although the terms may change from country to country as with blue, blue collar in the United States, I think there's an added value in acknowledging that class is an important facet of some people's identity. Poverty also does not capture other forms of class discrimination. Those who work extraordinarily hard in life but were born into wealthier homes and are sometimes disparagingly called TOFs. Another added value in prohibiting class discrimination is it would achieve a change in culture. So that in ter insulting terms such as chavs, toffs, and more indirectly, bog standard comprehensive and Essex girls in England, hillbillies in America, bogan in Australia, would no longer be acceptable. And importantly, such a change in language could lead to a change in political and media perceptions and depictions. Class fairness would not be competing with the other protected prohibited grounds. It would do the opposite it would reinforce the prohibitions on other discriminations. We do not, as Michael has said, live our lives with only one facet to our identity. An intersectionality of identities, which includes an express prohibition on class discrimination, would reflect the value that law would place on the dignity of all our lives. Finally, for those who argue, as many do, when change is suggested that now is not the time, we should remember the words of the civil rights activist. If the times aren't right, change the times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Van Buren. That was a very compelling and insightful account of how this might be implemented. And I think we've generated a few questions from our participants as to some of the aspects of that presentation. So I'd like to bring your attention to a question from Megan Campbell, who asks, prohibiting class discrimination and advocacy on class discrimination might work well in the UK as there is more overt discussion of class, whereas in other jurisdictions, there is less open political discourse on class. And if class doesn't have a political or cultural meaning, what should the name of the ground be is poverty or socio-economic class too problematic? I think that's a very good question, uh, Megan. Um, firstly, as it in a number of countries, uh, people would actually welcome 
a more open discussion. So there's this myth that, for example, I'm sure we'll hear from Michelle, that uh, the United States is classless, uh, Australia is classless. So it helps bring uh, this issue uh, to the fore. And secondly, I think uh, terms can be chosen um, by different countries as to uh, what would be the most appropriate. Uh, there are different concepts in Japan, as I mentioned in Latin America, the precariat. So uh, it, when one interprets a treaty, one could uh, use the term that's most appropriate. That would not be a problem. A state could attach a declaration, for example, to a treaty saying that it interprets class or whatever the French, Spanish, Arabic, Russian would be, Chinese, in the following ways. And that would uh, cause no problems whatsoever. Thank you very much. And I'll take two questions from former Bickle researchers, our alum, Richard and Siobhan, around what we might describe as substantive equality issues. So if I could synthesize the two questions, in your presentation, Professor Van Buren, you talked about the litigation of the discrimination, the harassment, the incident or the spark for someone saying this is an instance of discrimination on the basis of class, can I do something about it? The questions seem to be looking further, further beyond that to the socioeconomic causes of those inequalities and asking if you think the law should do something further up the, the stream, if you will. Can the law do something about the socioeconomic causes of these situations? To, to paint a, a bit of a parallel, I talked in the outset about the aspects of the Equality Act that haven't been brought into effect in terms of prohibiting discrimination on the basis of multiple identities. Another provision of the Equality Act seeks to do something slightly more proactive by having public authorities at the outset of putting together a new policy, thinking about advancing equality of opportunity and fostering good relations between people. So I suppose the synthesis of the two questions is, do you think there could be a similar class-based proactive duty to promote the alleviation of poverty, for example, that might lead to class discrimination? Yes, and one, one sees that in, uh, again, excellent questions, thank you very much. Uh, one, one sees that in some constitutions, Portugal, uh, Belgium, for example. So I don't think that is a problem. In, in terms of upstream or downstream, um, I gave my inaugural lecture on having uh, a socioeconomic rights act uh, in the UK. And at the time, my uh, vice chancellor described it as very radical. Um, now people are very seriously talking about socioeconomic rights in this country. We've fallen behind, you know, many countries in the world which have adopted that. And so I'm not saying that class discrimination by itself would solve everything. And in fact, law can't do that alone. But I am saying that I think class discrimination is of great value. And it's quite interesting that when we come to issues concerning poverty, we often say, oh, that's too complex for law. Um, and I think we have to explore that a bit more and actually see those complexities are something which human rights and equality law are, are grappling with daily. Excellent. And our final question from the 36 public law teams, Miriam, is around associative discrimination. And I, I believe the question is in the context of, at the moment, there are many algorithms producing psychographic profiling, not on the basis that I am a black man, but that I have black interests. Is that, if applied to the class lens, something that would also fit within the programme of legislative and judicial activity that you're recommending? Well, yes, it's sort of postcode lottery, uh, a very clear example of that, which goes on all the time and has profound implications on everything from uh, economic services for payment of uh, insurance to, uh, uh, as we saw in, in terms of the exams, the school exams. So yes, um, what, what it would mean is if you prohibit class discrimination, things like that should not happen in the first place. It should help create a public awareness. Um, 
that will prevent things happening. So this is not just to call for litigation, but it's, it, it, it's both symbolic and practical in terms of preventing discrimination arising in the first place. Thank you very much, very helpful. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Professor Sandra Fredman. Professor Fredman is the Professor of Laws of the British Commonwealth in the USA at Oxford University and is a professorial fellow at Pembroke College, Oxford. She was elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2005 and became a Queen's Council, again, honoris causa in 2012 and has written extensively on anti-discrimination law, human rights and labour law. She's edited and written several books and was awarded a three-year Leverhulme Major Research Fellowship on, on socioeconomic rights and substantive equality. So without further ado, I'd love to hear from you on the matters of capitalism and class discrimination that we are gonna hear from you now on. Um, thank you very much. Um, can everybody hear me? Um, okay, well, um, it's wonderful to be here. And happy Human Rights Day to everyone. And thank you very much to um, the, the Institute for bringing us all together and to Geraldine for these extremely insightful and very exciting remarks about new um, boundaries for um, for um, discrimination law. So um, I, I, I very much agree with the, with the principle of, of class. And in fact, I would like to see it taken further, which is situating class within the capitalist system that uh, really is now the, the drive, one of the driving forces perpetuating discrimination and inequality. More and more, I think, anyone aiming to address inequality must confront the way in which capitalism is operating in, in all its dark manifestations. Uh, and these are particularly brazen in the wake of the COVID epidemic. We have seen crony capitalism capturing the political elite even more explicitly with contracts um, being given under emergency powers without any accountability or any um, of even the semblance of market discipline in terms of competition or uh, gestures towards competence. Uh, and while we're seeing the rich get ever richer, those who are providing real value to society are, are getting poorer and more exploited in their work. So while I agree that uh, perhaps the COVID pandemic has made us value care workers even more. Um, the gestures that we did, clapping and so on, were really not followed up by any um, substantive um, in interventions. Only the only thing we hear is public sector pay being frozen. And in the meanwhile, we get uh, the ongoing ideology of neoliberalism, which is justifying privatization of health, more and more hidden, but more and more apparent, privatization of education and the evidence of incompetence and waste and corruption, which comes with the this kind of capitalist neoliberalism is, is being constantly disguised. So more broadly, I think not beyond the, cap the COVID pandemic, capitalism has always fed off and perpetuated racism and patriarchy and without taking the workings of capitalism into account, it's difficult to fully address the structural inequalities that maintain race and gender inequality, and of course, maintain class inequality. For example, um, a well-known example is the concept of value in the market, which attaches a lower value to women's work than to men's. This is permeated with patriarchy, but at the same time serves the capitalist market very well. And of course, it's been exacerbated with COVID, where, as I said, we've seen low paid carers who are predominantly women and disproportionately black and ethnic minority in the front line of dealing with the pandemic. And yet um, very little of the huge spoils of government 
have gone to revaluing caring work. Um, so although I would like to see the revaluation sustained, I, I don't think that has been. So I think the project of addressing class and capitalism is a crucial one, and it's much needed in the equality field. I've also argued in my work very much in favor of new grounds of discrimination, although I prefer to call them socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, I've also argued for the intersectionality of socioeconomic advantage with gender, race, and other grounds, including age. Um, and I've argued with Geraldine, um, together with Geraldine, on the fact that the hierarchy between civil and political rights and socioeconomic rights is uh, misconceived and wrong. But what, what I do have are three challenges to seeing class as a ground of discrimination. Not that they're insurmountable, but I would very much like to know Geraldine's thoughts about them. And the first one is the question of class identity. Um, I, um, the, the, as we move more and more into an age of identity politics, um, the worry is that the ways in which mobilization of working classes has been used in recent years, not to question class structures in general in relation to owners of capital and the rich, but rather to maintain the position of the working classes relative to those lower in the hierarchy or you know, the lumpen proletariat, migrants, refugees and asylum seekers, racialized groups, ethnic and religious minorities. So these left behind who have been appealed to by politicians such as Trump, Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson, they're encouraged to hang on to the small advantages they might have over migrants and other racial groups rather than to question the huge privileges of capitalists or to form the bonds of solidarity with those who are worse off. And in South Africa and apartheid where I, where, where I grew up, we saw this very clearly where the white working class was encouraged to be the most racist and to regard themselves as having most to lose from the end of apartheid. Uh, and I worry that it's not a coincidence that Trump, Farage and Johnson are all members of the elite class whose interest it is to maintain these class divisions. So creating a working class identity or not creating it because it is there already, um, the worry is how do we in in uh, facing class inequality actually define class in such a way that it doesn't exacerbate. Um, there's also the question of symmetry. Are we using class to cover all classes so that they might be used by upper classes to claim that they've been discriminated against by equalizing measures in favor of working classes? Um, so that's why I've always favored a more um, asymmetric one of, of socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, my second challenge is um, absolutely um, accept that what we need is to have a strongly and deeply intersectional analysis. But I worry about how intersectional class can really be unless we recreate it and cut it off from its, its, um, its roots. Uh, we know from uh, Marxist analysis, a feminist critique of the Marxist analysis of class, that um, it can, class can be very patriarchal. And it's not a coincidence that patriarchy survived and flourished in communist societies in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Um, even if we don't take a Marxist understanding of class and we, we look at social class, um, that's been built on patriarchal assumptions. So Traditionally, in sociology, a family social class has been measured by the head of household's occupation so that a woman's class is decided by that of her husband or her father. And these kind of um, use of, of household as a unit for measurement is, is, still relative, is still quite prevalent. And this leads to my third challenge, which is where do we put traditional female jobs? which, as I said, because they are female, have been undervalued and precarious. Um, cleaning, caring, catering and other service provision uh, positions are more precarious than ever. 
Um, so these are just challenges, not opposition to the notion of class. I do take Geraldine's point strongly that uh, definitional issues have never been a, a barrier to inclusion into uh, anti-discrimination law. But I think there are some risks and in deciding how we incorporate class, I would like to know how these risks are, uh, are dealt with. So I think this is an excellent and very important project. I look forward to seeing Geraldine's paper, her book, which I know is, is coming, and her responses to these challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And again, some really meaty food for thought there. We had quite a few questions that came up as a result of that. And I'm again going to try and synthesize them as best I can. And they do relate, in a sense, to the questions that Professor Van Buren answered earlier about substantive causes of equality or inequality, should I say. So our first question, <clears throat> apologies, from Katie Reid is as follows. Given that class discrimination is often accompanied by poverty, how in your view should claims be funded, particularly where there is little, if any, tangible or certain financial loss? Um, sorry, are we both responding or just, just me or me and Geraldine? I think if we could provide a succinct response to that and then okay. we'll fling the other questions after the other presentations. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, that's a really excellent question, Katie, because um, in si simply incorporating a ground into discrimination law doesn't mean that access to justice is uh, follows on. And the access to justice points um, are some of the, the really uh, important hidden or perhaps not even hidden barriers to people being able to claim their rights. So um, in that sense, individual claims uh, to being discriminated against uh, are sometimes not as as useful or effective as they could be. We need a very much better system of legal aid. We need trade unions to back these claims, but also importantly, and um, uh, Geraldine also mentioned, as did you, Michael, the, the need for uh, positive duties to uh, take steps to achieve equality, even in the absence of individual complaints so that the burden doesn't fall altogether on those individuals who are victims. Thank you. Thank you. And we had another question from Paul Crofts, which I think is the Turkey's voting for Christmas issue, where we have these inequalities and these power imbalances within society. And as has been suggested, a ruling class who vote in the interests of their cronies, what meaningful law could be legislated that would actually protect people in that situation? He asks, wouldn't any change in the law to outlaw class discrimination merely be a tokenistic smokescreen to ideologically hide the disgusting and outrageous class inequalities that still exist? So I think, um... Obviously, there are two sides to it. How we actually get this legislation in place is um, very challenging. Um, and what we've seen, particularly in the last 10 years, is, is much more of a reduction than an improvement or a, a, a progress in the range of um, equality law. With, with Brexit, which is already with us and probably around the corner even more so, even the uh, restraint of the European Union in terms of the extent to which the European Union was a, um, a major impetus to advancing equality law in the UK, that will be uh, gone or diluted. So I think we are in a, in, in, a, in a risky time. The government has just announced a review of the Human Rights Act. Uh, and that uh, provides even more risks. So I entirely take the point that we, uh, we, we cannot be confident that we could get legislative change, even if we wanted it. Uh, the second part of this is that whether if we do get it, it is, a, it is tokenistic. Um, I think that's mixed. I think, and um, I think I agree entirely with Geraldine that there are really important 
uh, educative and expression, expressive parts to the law that the message that is given through the law that, 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 uh, of what is discriminatory and wrong can be very important. But again, um, law can only work together with social movements and uh, the social movements are the ones that need to work to give the right, the, to give uh, effective meaning to these concepts. Thank you. Excellent. I'll try to combine questions in plenary that have come through that are similar to other questions once all of the speakers have had the opportunity to speak. Please, please, please continue to send through questions. They're really interesting and it's great to have an interactive element to these discussions. All right, great stuff. So moving on to our next speaker, Dr. Ms. Michelle Statz is an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota Medical School and she is trained as an anthropologist of law examining how socio-spatial dimensions of rurality influence legal advocacy, rights mobilization, and access to justice, focusing initially on Northern Minnesota and Wisconsin. And I'd have to say that her work is really, really important in our jurisdiction as well, as we have also encountered legal advice deserts where people can go from region to region, not being able to get legal aid for their housing, for example. So as, uh, an aspiring human rights lawyer in this jurisdiction. I take great insight from her work as well. So over to you, Michelle. Thank you. That was a very humbling introduction. Uh, I want to thank Geraldine for her incredibly compelling argument and also the Institute for the invitation to speak today. So as Michael just said, I'm trained as an anthropologist of law and am based in the United States. And I engage these questions a bit differently unsurprisingly. Um, my hope today is to offer a spatial dimension to this conversation on class. Um, and I'm throughout kind of prior prioritizing my ethnographic as opposed to theoretical work. So since 2017, I've been conducting mixed methods research across northern Minnesota and northern Wisconsin, the upper Midwest, if you will. This work is most generally on rural access to justice but I've been sheltering in place for a long time and have been looking over my data and think they're just as much about dignity, if not more so. So this research sets out to do two things. First, I, I effort to document the experiences and perspectives of legal professionals in this region that includes rural and remote tribal and state court judges, as well as private and, pri private and public interest attorneys. And then on the other side, I also consider rural low income and working class individuals conceptualizations of rights and their efforts to mobilize the law. In the past three years, my research team has conducted about 230 individual and household surveys with working class rural community members. And I've conducted really extensive qualitative interviews with about 200 individuals across the region on my own. Now, just as Geraldine highlighted a richly intersectional approach to class, I really want to underscore that I also understand rurality as itself an intersectional term. There's a tendency in the US to conflate rural with white or angry or especially right now Republican. And it's important um, to sort of emphasize that this research spans counties as well as sovereign nations and that it includes well-established Hmong, East African and Latinx populations, and so many other identities along the axes of race, ethnicity, gender, ability, age, and national origin. But what arguably unites these very diverse rural perspectives is a particular experience of class. This is at once a spatial and socioeconomic positionality, and it is also a deep experience of neglect. So of course, while access to justice is a need for individuals across the rural to urban continuum, what I think sets so many rural and remote areas apart in the US is that it is the majority of the population that is low income and working class. Indeed, rural poverty rates have exceeded urban poverty rates every year since 1959 and persistently high poverty counties are overwhelmingly rural. You can imagine that the rate of justiciable needs is accordingly high. 
In the US, the elderly, disabled, migrant workers, and veterans are all disproportionately represented in rural regions and all need diverse legal supports. So also do American Indians and Alaska Natives who additionally contend with a complex interplay of state, federal, and tribal law. Despite the clear need, most rural individuals cannot access legal assistance in civil and criminal matters. And there are a lot of reasons for this, but I will highlight um, one thing that's become very, very impactful and obvious is the role of growing attorney shortages. Indeed, many rural US counties now have few attorneys, if any. Most of the individuals I work with are solidly working class, meaning that they earn slightly too much to qualify for legal aid, but could never afford a private attorney, even if there was one in that particular area. I'm giving you this context because there is a clear access to justice crisis in rural America, and yet most of the proposed solutions are urban normative, meaning they are defined by individuals in urban areas, and they are designed with urban populations in mind. As a result, A2J or access to justice initiatives tend to presume and rely on consistent broadband, cellular, and smartphones, services and technologies that are often absent in rural regions. This lack of meaningful trusted assistance compounds the anxiety of someone who is already in a crisis situation. What's more, and as my research really powerfully evidences, the experiences of trying and failing to access justice are also humiliating. And to most of the rural individuals I've interviewed, that is not surprising. Indeed, this urban normative neglect of rural lived experience is pervasive across state and federal policy in the US, and it is uniquely and devastatingly coupled with condescension and disdain by the media, by progressive politicians, and by many, many scholars. Significantly, the rural stereotypes that abound are a form of erasure, one in which rural is depicted as unfailingly one-dimensional and non-diverse. Some go so far as to call this neglect or rural, some go so far, let me start over, as to not call this neglect or rural rhetoric, but a kind of sacrifice. Here we can trace policymakers' efforts to disadvantage rural regions for benefits that privilege more populated urban areas. This has led to limited oversight of fossil fuel extraction, reduced trade restrictions, and inequitable resource allocations to rural schools, healthcare, and judicial systems, which are becoming all the more apparent in this current pandemic moment. As a result, we see profound socioeconomic marginalization and outsized environmental burdens. We find markedly diverse working class people with no access to good jobs, good schools, and even and most simply information. So whether as neglect or condescension or sacrifice or some combination of it all, I believe that rural regions in the US surface a profoundly vast kind of discrimination on the basis of class in a particular place. This is the intersectionality that Geraldine and also Sandra mentioned, and I think it deserves very meaningful consideration. So returning then or bringing this conversation back to my work on access to justice, I thought about it a great deal. And I wonder if we could someday replace urban normative, urban normative initiatives, urban normative policies with discriminatory. And there is incredible symbolic value in that shift in language. But I think the practical value will rely on something much deeper, especially when we consider that many of these same regions do not even have attorneys. I love the work that Geraldine is doing, and I think it is a critical step toward reestablishing trust and creating more dignified and spatially relevant forms of access. Thank you. Excellent. A pleasure as always to hear from you. We did have one question arise, which was from Megan Campbell again, where she asks whether there is less resistance, more success and more willingness to understand how rurality creates disadvantage as opposed to class as rurality might not directly engage with how protecting class can challenge the capitalist system. I think I need to read this question. 
And it's nice to hear from Megan. I'm not able to see it. Do you think you could rephrase it, Michael? Sure thing. So I, I think Megan is asking about the strategic difference between your argument being that rurality is the frame to look at this rather than class, which poses quite a ideological and perhaps systemic challenge to the capitalist system. I don't I don't think rurality is the the starting point. Um, my hope certainly in in offering this focus on rurality is not so much an intervention in the conversation, but just to add some dimension to it. Um, I think that class is differently experienced, obviously, by all of the diverse identities that we've um, already identified, but but how it plays out in space also matters. Um, and I think so just complicating or unsettling the conversation a bit is important. Thank you, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to hand over to our final speaker, Alexandra Wilson, who is amongst other things, a barrister specializing in criminal and family law, who has written one of my absolute favorite books of the year in black and white. And I absolutely can say that I have it right there. That's the audio book. <laughs> I'm currently on her section looking at issues in the youth court and it's just ribald with some very, some very gripping and fascinating moments marred by some tragedy. And I think it's, clear that she has deep experience of inequality and is able to advise as to how things can be made better within the system, whilst also helping us to admire what is still noble and just about criminal and family law. And for those who haven't got it, I absolutely recommend it. In addition to writing that fantastic book and being a, a barrister, Alexandra was also a contributor to Bickle's Reimagining the Law series in which she said that the legal profession should reflect the diversity of the population and that it's lawyers' jobs to represent people and that they should always be representative. She said that in the UK, black people are overrepresented in the criminal justice system, but they're significantly underrepresented in the legal profession. And if she were to reimagine the law, she would fix both of those issues, which I found to be one of the most really resonant contributions that we received in that campaign and I'm really pleased that we're able to get you for this evening so without further ado over to you. Thank you so much Michael um, so yeah just to start really where Michael you left off um, one of the things that I hope hasn't yet been mentioned only because um, otherwise my, my entire talk will be done but I joined late having been caught in court today um, is that actually this class issue doesn't just affect clients and, and those appearing in the courts, it's actually an issue that affects our profession um, and the judiciary. And it's really important to look at it from that angle too. I talk a lot about uh, racial diversity, but also class is an issue that has affected me and I think is really important within our justice system. And um, it's not often, you know, I appear largely within the, the London courts and the Essex courts, but there isn't much variation in, in terms of the people that I'm appearing in front of. A lot of the judges that I appear in front of are white. Um, the majority of them that I appear in front of, you know, have accents um, that uh, the south southeastern accents. I think is the you know from the from the south. So London accents or um, there's not much variation in their accents. <laughs> I think is the bottom line. Um, there are of course um, a lot of male judges. And of course, a part of this being you know, being a judge takes some time you know, in the job. It, you know, they tend to be older, and that lack of diversity has a real impact on clients because they walk into those courtrooms and they see people that often don't look like them or people they know or their family and friends. Um, and so that's not just a race issue; that is also a class issue. And I thought I'd kind of start with that. Um, for me, what I really wanted to address, and I, I actually am really gutted that I miss Professor Geraldine Van Buren's um, talk earlier, and I'm definitely going to watch the recording. Um, that's what happens when you're caught in, <laughs> caught in court all day. Um, but uh, the, 
I think for me, this discussion about class um, is, is so interesting because class is so difficult to define. Um, and I'm sure all of the other speakers have done a much better job than I could possibly do at defining what class actually means. Um, but I think we probably would all agree that class captures so much now. It's not something that can be really narrowly defined in a way that, you know, something like um, race might be or gender might be. Of course, there are still nuances in both of those. Um, but class, I think, for, for me, certainly, I feel it's a very, very broad category. I remember even studying at university and, and I did PPE, so politics, philosophy and economics, and I tried to do as much sort of sociology within that as I could. And class was just such a huge topic. It was just always something that, you know, even my, my tutors who were experts in the area were just like, we can't, you can't define class in a sentence. Um, I know that this evening there's been a lot of discussions about intersectionality. And for me, you can't explore class without looking at, at gender, without looking at race, without looking at so many of these other issues. And, and as I think I've probably already made clear, race for me is something that I, that I look at a lot. And in raising issues of race, I'm often met with people telling me that actually it's a class issue. Um, and I'm sure people probably have experienced that both way around, academics and any kind of campaigners who talk about the issues and most recently I was talking about um, the disproportionate policing of uh, young black boys and I was talking about how stop and search rates are so there's such a disparity in stop and search rates um, for young black boys compared to you know the rest of the population so for example black people are stopped and searched at a, a rate of 38 per a thousand people whereas white people are stopped and searched at a rate of four per a thousand people. So you, you're over nine times as likely to be stopped and searched if you're black. And I, I often tweet my views <laughs> and the responses are so often, this has nothing to do with race. This is all about class. You know, this is because black people are living in areas where there are much higher rates of poverty and therefore race is an irrelevant factor. Now, first of all, I don't agree with that, but even if that were to be the case, there is still a fundamental issue that, that poorer areas or lower socioeconomic areas are being over policed. Because I don't think that e even in that response, you're disputing that those areas are over policed. Um, and so people are feeling different effects of the law purely based on you know, where they live or, or how affected they are by issues such as poverty. And that kind of leads to the second thing I want to talk about, which is defining class, um, not only in an intersectional way, but, but looking at finances and, and how important the role of money is in defining class. I certainly um, found from personal experience that, that actually there were often people that might have a lot of money or have a significant amount of money, but deemed to be what we might consider working class or, or, or a lower socioeconomic class because of so many other factors. And it goes back to, you know, what does class really mean? Um, I remember people at university and um, I went to Oxford where there, there was an element of um, class difference in, in, in different kind of class groups, I guess. But there was definitely comments on people being new money or old money. Um, and that, again, is a, a reflection of the fact that class can't just be defined by, by the amount of money you have, because there was definitely a sense that, you know, that, that person might have money, but they're not from they're not from our, our class, you know, and th there was that real distinction. So I don't think it's something that class can be defined by money, but that doesn't mean that we we should ignore the huge impact that that money or the huge role that money plays in people's access to justice because I actually think money is one of the most important things in access to justice. There are increasing legal aid cuts. I do a lot of legal aid work in both my family and criminal practice. And so often, particularly in my family practice where, where legal aid has really been tightened, I'm so often against litigants in person, so often, and it, and it just isn't fair. And that's, you know, I make every effort that I can to try and balance the power and try and you know have those those discussions before court and explain in a factual way as much as I can to the other side but often they won't trust me and I, I understand to be honest I completely understand you know of course I have to say I can't advise you I can't give you any legal advice I represent the other side and then I'm trying to explain the process to them 
understandably they might look at me and be like are you trying to are you trying to trip me up you know, I, and quite often they don't want to share information and it can be actually quite obstructive to the process. Um, but that that's not me blaming those litigants in person. That's obviously a consequence of many people not being able to afford legal representation. And it, it definitely puts people at a real disadvantage in court. Um, and I think that the final thing that I kind of want to come on to in relation to that is education. Um, and the link, the link really is that you know, some people are able to pay for their education and, and some aren't. And that, of course, has a, a huge impact on um, your, I guess, your, your, what you end up doing later in life. And I say that having gone to a state school. Um, so I, you know, my parents didn't pay for my education as much as I pleaded with them to send me to the fancy private school in my area. They, they didn't. But, um, you know, the, what we do have a system. Um, and it, again, I think this is, has a huge impact on class that where we have a private and a, a public school system and you know whilst private many private schools are offering more bursaries there's still always going to be a separation when people can pay for a premium ed education and and frankly if it wasn't premium if it wasn't better people wouldn't pay for it so you know the reason people pay for it is because they know that they're getting a better, better education for their children whether that's smaller classes so more you know closer contact time with teachers whether it's greater resources you know I would argue it's not better teaching but that's because both my parents are teachers in state schools and I think <laughs> they would absolutely be furious if I suggested it was better teaching but there are definitely you know more resources and facilities and so and they of course have a, a knock-on effect and we know that kind of tying back to the first point I made, the profession is has a disproportionate number of privately educated barristers, um, the judiciary, pri again, private schools are overrepresented in the judiciary. Um, so that's kind of my breakdown of, of what class could be, um, completely accepting that class cannot be defined in a sentence and how I think class affects access to justice. And thank, thank you so much for having me on here. I feel, I feel quite honored to be amongst everyone else here. So thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you involved and we look forward to working with you in the future. Alexandra, there were a couple of questions that came through in relation to some of the themes that you were addressing. The first is from Bickle alumna Siobhan Smith, who is asking about whether education has a significant role to play in eliminating class discrimination. And very similarly to some of the experiences that you'd spoken about in terms of the assumptions that people make based on your accent and regional pronunciation, etc. She was relaying an experience where one of her mentors, when she told him she wanted to be a barrister, told her that she should consider elocution lessons. What were your headline points about those matters? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think education has a huge impact. One of the things I didn't mention just now is networks. You know, the, the, the bar is still definitely one of those professions where networks help and I'm not what I'm not suggesting is that you know you will get pupillage because you know people but you definitely will get the experience because it's an info it a lot of the work experience is still relatively informal it's shadowing self-employed barristers and so if you know self-employed barristers you're going to have a much higher chance of being able to shadow them to gain that work experience you're more likely to be able to see you know senior cases to even just be able to get to know people so that when you go to interview you're familiar with those sort of environments for some people it's really alien um you know even the dining experiences when you're going to the to Middle Temple, or Inner Temple, I said Middle because I'm at Middle, um, but you know, these great halls that are beautiful and you're dining in a very, very formal setting, that can of course be very intimidating to people. Um, and in answering that question, I have forgotten the second half. If I was in court, I would have made a note, but I didn't, I just went for it. So <laughs> what was the second half, Michael? Forgotten myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was a question of, of whether the regional accent has a role and what you would suggest as the contribution of that to discrimination on basis of class. Yeah, I think I think accents have a I, I think accents have a huge role. It's particularly in I guess it links to, links to the education part. Oh, I remember it was about the elocution, wasn't it? Um, you know, I think that I throughout you know it's particularly at university but even now people sort of 
say oh <laughs> you, got, you got an essex accent and i and it's funny because actually my friends at home all think i'm really posh <laughs> so it's this real it's this real contrast because <laughs> all my friends at home are like oh my gosh she, alex she's got so posh she sounds like and i'm like you do realize at work everyone thinks i sound like really not posh um so it's it's it's, it's actually quite funny seeing the difference and i guess that again ties into this kind of this class discussion that it's contextual it's completely dependent on your environment that you know in one environment I might be seeing you know my friends would probably say Alex is super middle class like she's she's really posh now whereas you know in the context of the bar actually I'm probably not very posh and um, obviously bearing in mind that barrister is probably uh, considered a posh profession by the general public um but i think i think it's it's really contextual so i also if anyone has been advised to do elocution completely unnecessary you don't you don't need to do it i mean as long as you can be clearly understood i think that's the key thing with any any kind of advocacy role is that you need to of course be clearly understood and you know if someone's accent perhaps made it more difficult for them to to be understood that would be the only time where you would ever think you know, maybe I need to to, to slightly change the way I'm, I'm speaking just so that I can be clearly understood. But I think accents make make advocacy much more exciting. You know, it makes it different. You don't hear the same voice over and over again. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. So with the panellists' consent, I'd like to take us through to 5.30. And we received quite a few questions that I thought would sit better in a plenary format than posed to individual speakers. So if panellists have a couple of points they'd like to make in respect of each of these questions, that'd be greatly appreciated. And I'd like to start with a couple of questions raised by my Bingham Centre colleagues, Murray Hunt and Anthony Wenson, that are similar to the point made earlier about how we should try to get on the front foot about discrimination and not wait for litigation where there is an incident that is justiciable in order to try to prevent these things. Murray's question is asking, section one of the Equality Act 2010 imposes a duty on public bodies to have regard to the desirability of essentially acting strategically to eliminate inequalities and social disadvantage. And he notes that this is brought into force in Scotland in 2018 and Wales this year. And the question is how far will its commencement in England go towards meeting some of the concerns about class discrimination. So it's around getting a really proactive duty for public authorities to exercise strategic powers to prevent social and, and economic disadvantage. You want us to answer? Yes, please. Professor Fredman, do you want to go first? Ah, uh, yes. Um, thanks, Murray. That's uh... A, a really important question. I, I think it would it would definitely go some way because it would force attention to be paid to the social and economic consequences. Uh, on the on the wording of it, it is a very weak duty. You, you you only have to have regard to the desirability of eliminating these differences. And compared to the public sector equality duty, you, it, you, which says you have to have due regard, this only has have regard to the desirability but nevertheless i think it would bring this on um, directly onto the agenda it would expressly require accountability on these issues hopefully um, equality impact assessments would follow which are not simply tick box but which really do draw um, the attention of people who are making these decisions to the importance of this so i, I think it would certainly be a start and it, it should certainly be brought into effect and um, in many ways it is a scandal that it never was because it is a piece of legislation and the um, discretion not to bring or to choose when to bring something into effect shouldn't be um, extended for 10 years so I think there's also a kind of constitutional question about that it should have been either ex you know it should have been brought before parliament if they didn't want to bring it into effect but um, it should have been brought into effect long ago by now. So I'd certainly agree. And related to that point, if I could, there's a follow up question around whether if we are going to think more substantively and trying to pin down systemic reforms that are going to make more of a difference than weak duties, whether or not the tax system should have a role to play in eliminating these inequalities. And I think I suspect your answer to that question already. 
Professor Fredman. That, that one was for you. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, yes, definitely. Um, I think that as equality lawyers, we should really be paying much more attention to taxation and to um, the ways in which tax perpetuates inequalities, although it really ought to be there to redress inequalities. Um, so, so yes, I think really one of the key, um, one of the really important campaigns need to be, first of all, to get those who owe taxes to pay them properly. Secondly, to um, reverse the current trend, which is uh, regressive taxation in the forms of um, sales taxes, which everybody have to, has to pay, like VAT, which have been slowly but surely insidiously creeping up as a form of taxation as against wealth taxes and uh, taxes on, on capital, um, etc. So yes, I, I do think that tax should be at the centre of, of, of our endeavours. And there was a question from Niall Byrne. As Professor Van Buren notes, class discrimination by definition encompasses a range of categories. Does the panel think it is likely that any prohibition of class discrimination would be abused by those from higher socioeconomic backgrounds who naturally have access to lawyers, e.g. by challenging access schemes and even anti-capitalist sentiments? If so, how do you think this could be limited? Um, thank you. I think that's an excellent question. Can I just address for a moment uh, Murray's question as well? Absolutely. Because, uh, I, I agree with Sandy that it's a good step, but not enough. But Scotland itself uh, feels it's not enough because Scotland's going to incorporate the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which of course will, will completely uh, transform uh, the landscape and has now in the process its first reading the Convention on the Rights of the Child which creates such rights uh, for children so you have an admission there from Scotland it's a good first step but we need to go further. Um, it, there's always a, a question of abuse uh, in relation to uh, any uh, proposed uh, change but I also think it's going to be uh, very little abuse providing that access schemes and others uh, are presented uh, by the government and local authorities in a very transparent way, linking it to rationality, need, uh, the uh, underutilization of a whole range of services. Uh, Alexandra spoke very eloquently about, uh, and also Michelle, about uh, access to legal services, uh, but also there's access to health services. Uh, closure of uh, GP surgeries, uh, the adequate housing, uh, even adequate standard of living. So I think providing is transparent. And if you did introduce class discrimination, the easiest way obviously would be uh, through the Equality Act, but you could have a separate act. You could require the government state uh, every time it introduces legislation, whether it's consistent with, as we do with the Human Rights Act, um, with things like uh, class discrimination and other forms of discrimination. So um, I don't think we have to be hidebound uh, by that. Um, but I certainly don't think that uh, um, the abuse uh, is very likely. And I do think there's a need if you're going to bring people on board. Uh, you know, I've, I've had these discussions about class discrimination and, and often people say to me, well, I don't like being called a toff. Um, or origins apparently are from toffee nosed. Um, just as insulting as for me to be told, you know, when I went to perhaps Alexandra, uh, a bog standard comprehensive. Uh, and so if we're going to prohibit class discrimination, I think we have to do it equally for all. Thank you. And that, I think, relates to one of the themes that have been expressed by a number of speakers and also in a question which is around symmetry. So Shinoi Bold asked regarding the issue of symmetry, do we maybe need a, a symmetric protection of class discrimination in cases of intersectionality? For example, headscarf wearing Muslim women are only confronted with discrimination in the form of prohibitions if they belong to an upper class. The Muslim cleaning lady is not regarded as an issue while a Muslim judge is. I'll put that in the panelist chat so we can all have a look at it. I, th I think the 
the interpretation that this attendee might have taken is because we were discussing a situation in which you might have a one-sided cause of action where somebody from in inverted commas the working class might be able to wield the the, the sword but somebody from the the upper classes in inverted commas could not i think that's where the logic is being applied in a specific situation did one of our panelists have an, an immediate view on this question well i mean if we're going to prohibit all class discrimination which is what i recommend then that issue should not arise it will arise uh equally uh to, to to all women and the point of the ILO's um, uh, working women's initiative uh, is to um, re-establish value of women who are doing work like cleaning but not at the price of creating some kind of exclusion or prejudice to uh, women of other classes whose work may already be valued. And I can see how subtlety in that situation is, is certainly something that the courts would have to deal with if any specific provision were passed. We, we had a number of other comments that I thought could be grouped as addressing difficulties in access and barriers to the legal profession. Anthony talks about the scandal of unpaid internships in international law and human rights, which may well, well undermine the ambit of many of the organisations who operate in the space. There were comments that we might want to promote the magistracy as an option for young people in order to create more diverse experiences for those in the magistrates court. And Kale Best was agreeing with Alexandra, but also saying that social capital can be quite difficult to realistically address in some of the initiatives that we're discussing. Alexandra, did you want to come back on those points? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just following on from the last point, I think that that's the, that social capital is really difficult, but there are a lot of charities doing something about it, which um, I think is excellent. I think there are a lot of groups. So, for example, I was part of um, a scheme called Target Oxbridge when I first applied to Oxford. Um, and they're a, they're a, a charity that support people from uh, black Caribbean or black African backgrounds um, applying to Oxford and they don't just um, support you in the kind of formal process but they also have you know podcasts and webinars and discussions where you can talk about you know frankly the things that you're that you might be quite worried about so you know going and living in an environment where so when I was at Oxford I was the only black person in my year you know that was a that was a real change from my school for example or you know what, what did people do about, um, you know, getting their hair done? Were there black hairdressers in Oxford? You know, and things like that, that actually they would tackle, but they'd also tackle, you know, the, the things that people might be worried about in terms of like social class. So, you know, I remember I remember one of my mentors telling me which order to kind of use the, the knives and forks in, because I remember being like, I've watched a film on this, but I have no idea which order, you know, where do I go left, right, or start at the top? I had no idea. And so she just sort of went through that sort of, that, those things with me. We had lectures where we'd sort of talk about, issues so that we were used to talking about things over dinner um you know in a in a quite a formal way that you that you might not be similar to you know at home where you might have you know casual chat about what school was like um you know you're going into an environment where you're expected to sit with professors and quite important people and, and, and maintain you know quite serious conversation which is actually a real shock to the system for some people and um, so there were a lot of organizations that that's just one but there were a lot that are trying to supplement that and um, kind of fill those gaps which I think is definitely progress. It, it's something, um, yeah, that's why I'd add there. <laughs> Great stuff. So we're coming to the end of today's webinar and I'd like to ask the panelists to reflect on one thing as a result of the conversation with the other panelists that they have learned or thought about or are going to address in their practice going forward that inspires them and gives them strength as a result of today's contributions. So shall we start with Professor Van Buren? Uh, well, I've learned from uh, all the presentations, um, but uh, I, as, as a, a Cockney and therefore urban, um, I learned a great deal from Michelle 
um, and her discussion about uh, rural deserts in terms of uh, access to law and everything else. And uh, But I learned from all of you and I'm very grateful to all of you. Excellent stuff. And Dr. Stats? Yeah, I'm equally grateful. And just listening to what you were saying right now, Alexandra, I, I don't think we can underestimate the value of those sorts of programs and those kinds of lived educational experiences. I was reflecting on how much I could have benefited from that. And I think we also can't underestimate the power of having such a sort of top level and relatively elite conversation about these things because it means that people are paying attention. Um, and I'm just really, really grateful to participate and listen to all of you. And Professor Fredman. Ah, yes, it's just so it has been such a rich discussion. It's it's very difficult to summarize or all the many things, but I think the, the, that in, it points to what I do want to say, which is it's so important to be having this discussion and to be bringing class into the focus uh, where when it's or it's so often hidden. Uh, and yet it's so often, um, as, as, a, as I said, exploited by particularly now the political elite and, and the wealthiest in society in ways which are, are not properly addressed. So thank you so much to uh, the organizers and to Geraldine for bringing, a, bringing us together with this focus and, and to everybody who's contributed to the, this discussion and to everyone on the panel. Thank you for contributing. And last but certainly not least, Alexandra. And um, can I can I also say thank you? And, and again, how <laughs> honoured I feel to be on this panel. Um, I joined late, so unfortunately can't comment on anyone other than um, Michelle, who I, I think I joined <laughs> as Michelle was starting. Um, but yeah, I think the, the overall is that I completely agree with Professor Fredman that the fact that we're having these discussions is so important. Um, the fact that we're talking about class, even the fact that we're talking about what, what class means, um, you know, there will be lots of people who might not be able to, to vocalise what it is they feel is putting them at a disadvantage. Um, or, you know, they might recognise that they're finding things a bit harder than other people and they just can't put their finger on why that is. And it might be, for example, a, a lack of social networks um, and they you know, it, at the moment, it doesn't, it might not fall neatly into the categories that we sort of recognise as discrimination, so race or, or gender or sexuality, and they're sort of thinking, but I am finding this so much harder than everyone else seems to be finding this, you know, I just don't have those connections. Um, and so I think it's really important that class remains on the agenda and, and continues to be talked about and, and properly addressed. And thank you, Michael. Honestly, you've, you've done a great job. So thank you so much. Hey, too kind. <laughs> so, I've learned a tremendous amount from being able to hear from all of you and you're all doing inspirational work and Geraldine has really made me think about the contrast between dualist and monist systems and the extent to which a judge is able to write class discrimination into a framework that doesn't necessarily include it. And Dr. Stats has talked quite extensively about how rurality is merely the prism through which a range of other socioeconomic factors can be read. And that for me was again, really important to check some of my thinking in this area. Professor Fredman talking about the systemic rather than the juridical for me, again, as someone who teaches law and spends a lot of time thinking about legislative instruments was a reminder about where this stuff comes from when a claimant presents with one of these issues. And Alexandra, I learn a tremendous amount from you every day as a keen follower of your Twitter and a reader of your book. And I'd like to thank again, all of the panelists, everyone from the Bickle team who was involved in putting this together, Professor Van Buren for her vision and leadership for this, and all of you at home who have taken the opportunity to join this Bickle event. I'd like to say that this is very much the start of Bickle's interventions in this area. 2020 has been a very difficult year in which I think the divisions and injustices around the world have been brought into sharp relief, not just in the death of George Floyd, but also in the disproportionate impact of Black, Asian and minority pandemic. And I think 
the work that the Centre for International Law will do in 2021 that Kristen will lead is going to be really important for the arts, cultural and cultural heritage elements of this agenda. At the Bingham Centre, we are going to be taking forward a programme of work inspired by the struggles of the Windrush generation to look at the impact of racial injustice in the spheres of law, politics and justice. And we would really, as a result of the fantastic contributions from our attendees, love to involve everybody who's had something to say. Apologies to those whose questions we weren't able to ask for the purposes of time. And thank you again, everyone, for being part of this rich programme. So we will endeavour to get the recording of this event available and hopefully, I believe, within the next 24 hours you'll be sent a link so you can view it back and hopefully I didn't say anything too embarrassing on that second replay. Thank you very much everyone and have a great evening. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks Michael for sharing. No problem.